this is how he sees Kali. Yeah. She is always fighting against the dragons. And she's been an inspiration to all of us to keep fighting against the dragons. And the trouble is that every time we lop a head off, two heads grow. Seven. So, <laughs> seven heads. So, <coughs> please be sure that you have one of these. And uh, kudos to the photographer who gave us a wonderful photograph to remember her by. <coughs> so thank you for whoever's responsible for that. Uh -huh. Good, thank you. And um, so uh, I would like to do a little housekeeping before we start. Um, we're going to have uh, a ceremony here uh, that's going to be freewheeling and very informal and unplanned. Uh, and that will be followed by refreshments. But for those of you who need to know, uh, the bathrooms are down the hall to your left. You will see there is a male bathroom and a female bathroom. So we have thought of everybody here. And the lights are on, I think, so you should have no trouble groping in the dark. Um, so welcome again. Uh, afterwards, uh, you're very free to go into the garden. You can go through those doors, but not these. Because if you try to open these doors, the entire building will collapse. So, without further commentary, uh, we have a, a, a kind of a, an organized uh, sequence here of people who are going to share observations with us. And then after, what I'm hoping is that people will feel energized by all of that and will feel totally free to stand up and share whatever reminiscences, scabbers and otherwise, you may want to share about Kali. Uh, so I'm going to start by asking if Jane would be kind enough to read uh, what she has brought us today. Well, it's a real privilege to be asked to go first. Um, Kali gave me this little essay about a year ago, and she seemed to attach some importance to it. And when I read it, I thought I could see why. And uh, she printed it out on nice, heavy paper. I think she'd been keeping it. She wrote it about 1991. So she'd been keeping it, and it was important to her. And I think maybe, it, so it, I hope it will be revealing to you. Um, I'll try to channel Kali, but then, of course, who could? So um, you, know, you need to do that <coughs> on your own a little bit. Try to hear her voice. Um, on Mandela, politics, and the natural order of things. There is a shade in my bedroom window that I pull halfway up so I can see the stars when I'm lying in bed. It keeps things in perspective. When I turn off the light after a bad day and look out at the tiny luminous dots spread across the night sky, I recall that our little planet is part of a solar system that is just one of a limitless, limitless number of stars making up the Milky Way which is only one of a limitless number of galaxies. It calms me down, and I soon fall asleep. The night after Nelson Mandela left the Bay Area, July 30, 1990, I thought about the stars differently. I opened the shade all the way, and gazing into the darkness, tried to fathom what a man, so great in his ability to endure, to forgive, with his uncompromising honesty, wisdom, and commitment to freedom, meant in the larger scheme of things. Nelson Mandela was the first world political leader that I had accepted unreservedly since FDR, and I was very young then. Once I understood that wisdom and inner authority have almost nothing to do with political power, I maintained a healthy skepticism of even the more progressive leaders. Mandela was different. He passed the test. He'd been in hell for 27 years and had returned with his integrity intact and his determination to bring about a free South Africa as strong as ever. And somehow, Mandela's freedom had brought me out of a nine-year retreat from political activism. Actually, the events in East Berlin and Eastern Europe had begun the process. If things could change as quickly and unexpectedly as they had there, maybe it was possible to reverse the terrible devastation human beings were visiting upon an Earth that could soon be incapable of supporting most forms of life. Had we who celebrated the changes known what was going to happen, we would have been more guarded in our enthusiasm. 
We know that change is never that simple, and we keep forgetting, but sometimes we may need to forget. I was particularly excited about Czechoslovakia that another honest man and an artist of depth, integrity, and vision had been elected president. I began reading Václav Havel's political essays and was thrilled to find the head of state say and mean such things as, in everyone there is some longing for humanity's rightful dignity, for moral integrity, for free expression of being, and a sense of transcendence over the world of existence. Or, if a better economic and political model is to be created, it must derive from profound existential and moral changes in society. It must above all be an expression of life in the process of transforming itself. In Czechoslovakia, the great experiment was beginning. I fantasized about moving there to participate in the creation of the new society. Then, on February 6th, 16th, 1990, it was announced that Nelson Mandela would be freed from prison the next day at 5.15 a.m. I was electrified by the news. I set my clock for 4.45 a.m., wildly excited about the imminent freedom of a man <coughs> who I knew relatively little about, except that he had been in prison for more than half his adult life because he had refused to compromise his principles. But then, so had Walter Sisulu and the six other Rivonia trial defendants. And while I had been happy to hear the news of their release, it had not affected me the same way Mandela's had. I knew the media's attention to him had something to do with it, but there was more to it than that. A friend told me that as a young man, Sisulu, who was the great intellect of the ANC, had recognized in Mandela those qualities that could galvanize a movement and had helped to groom him for the role he was to play in the liberation of South Africa. At 5 a.m., I turned on the TV and waited like everyone outside the prison and in towns all over South Africa were waiting until the car carrying Mandela <coughs> finally came through the gate and he emerged to the joyous din of thousands cheering his freedom. The moment is etched on my memory. He looks a bit confused. And then a smile spreads across his face and his closed fist springs into the air. Nelson Mandela is free. Nelson Mandela is free. It took me a couple of days to realize that something inside of me had shifted. Mandela's release had had some sort of cathartic effect on me. I felt less caught up in personal issues. My energy had shifted to the world around me once again, only this time with more clarity. So much for my personal reactions. What does Mandela's freedom mean in the big picture? And the freedom of his comrades on the changes in Eastern Europe? And how does the Gulf conflict fit in? As the war in the Middle East grinds on, though the battle is officially, officially over, it is clear that neither Bush nor Saddam have the stuff of great leadership that it would have taken to avoid war, the ability to see their actions in the larger context of human civilization and its needs. In addition to contemplating the galaxies and politics, I've been reading and thinking about the mysteries of the mind. Why do human beings act in ways that are detrimental to ourselves and the rest of life? Our brains have something up there that other animals don't, don't, since we're the ones who have created a culture to reflect and perhaps balance the inner workings of our minds. But who's to say we're smarter? As Robert Ornstein and Paul Ehrlich state in their recent book, New World, New Mind, our brains are not very different from those of our ancestors 35,000 years ago. We have more gray matter to contain greater amounts of information, but how our brains work is still the same. <laughs> if we don't make it, it will be ironic that we humans will have been around for a shorter period of time than most other species. I've also been thinking about proportion, rhythm, vibration, and geometry. It seems there are patterns often reflecting a mathematical relationship known as the golden mean that show up throughout nature, from plants to heavenly bodies, art, architecture, music, and even economic trends. The existence of these patterns makes a strong case for the interconnectedness of all things. George E. Doxey, an architect and a very wise man, asks in his book, The Power of Limits, why these same proportions do not show up in our social forms. Because we've lost the capacity to dream. A line from another favorite book comes to mind in answer. 
I wrote to Doxy and asked him what he thought about the question. He said that when Marshall McLuhan was in the Indonesian islands, he noticed that they don't have a word for artistic. After thinking about it, McLuhan realized they don't need one because everyone lived artistic lives. That, that, that is, they did everything with the utmost care and dedication. To me, it means living life directly and honestly, living one's personal truth as opposed to the artist who lives life indirectly for someone else's truth in his or her scramble for success as defined by the marketplace. Now, when someone talks about a friend who has lost a sense of proportion, I hear it in a different way. The Gulf War took place because the leaders of the two countries primarily responsible for it lost a sense of proportion or relation to the larger whole. Which brings me back to Havel and Mandela. Why did these two men receive such an enthusiastic response from the American people and even our elected officials? Some say the response to Havel was because of his opposition to communism, but Mandela associates with communists and has supported guerrilla warfare. He was revered here even by those who opposed some of his political tactics. People mentioned his courage and his refusal to compromise his values, but the thing they were most in awe of was his ability to endure and forgive. Perhaps we fear we have not been able to endure the assaults on our own spirits. Perhaps we want to be forgiven for all the things we have done to others and ourselves in the name of being realistic or self-protective. Perhaps deep inside us where we hold the hurts that cause racial hatred, misogyny, and the rationalization that wars are necessary, we want to be honest, to live our lives with the integrity and direct experience we barely remember, but we do remember, we once had. If we could translate the rhythms of Mandela's thoughts and interactions with others into mathematical terms, would we discover the golden mean proportion? Havel also has that integrity, the kind one gets when living for something greater than oneself. <coughs> the members of Congress seemed to know he wasn't there for self-aggrandizement. Perhaps deep down we all yearn to live our lives for something greater than ourselves, something directly felt rather than absorbed from others' values. How does one begin to do that again? Last year, as I was riding a crowded bus through Chinatown, the front door opened and an old Chinese woman focused all her attention on pulling herself slowly up the two steps into the bus. Two middle-aged men sat next to the stairs, gesturing animatedly as they talked together in Italian. One of them noticed the old woman, and as he continued talking, took hold of her arm and helped her into the bus. Then he got up so she could sit down. She took his arm and seat for granted, and never looking at him or anyone else. A couple of stops later, she got up and started down the stairs. Just before disappearing down the last step, she turned her head slightly and sent a nod of thanks in their direction. The two men laughed and continued their conversation. Suddenly, I was filled with a feeling of joy. For a moment, I inhabited a world where everyone knows we are responsible for one another. On the streets, in stores, on playgrounds, across national boundaries, how would political decisions be made if we all felt that connection? Later, just before falling asleep, I looked out into the darkness, and the Big Dipper constellation filled the window frame. Once again, I wondered about the light I saw from stars that may no longer exist, and that new stars may be coming into being at this very moment. Holly Grossberg, 191. Thank you very much for those words. Uh, <coughs> my feeling is that some of you may want to have a copy of this really fine writing. Uh, and if so, I think it would be important for you to remember to sign the guest book and perhaps put your address there. And if you'd like a copy, please do indicate that you would like to us to mail you one. Um, thank you. So now I would like to call on one of Kali's friends who shares experience with her uh, over the eight years that she was part of the Bread and Puppet Theater. 
because Kali was the kind of person who ran away and joined the, the circus. <laughs> and, uh, and she did that in many, many ways, and in fact, that's how I met her. She wanted to run away and join my circus.